Sí. Good morning. Dame la derecho. Okay. So apologies, we're starting a little late today. Uh, that's due to some traffic and logistics issue. So uh, everyone, thank you for being with us today, this morning, uh, on our first executive uh, breakfast forum uh, of Amsham Ethiopia. So today, uh, so on, on behalf of uh, the Amsham members, um, board members, and also president and general manager, we warmly welcome you. Um, and then uh, I would like to say just a, a big thank you to Hannah for making this happen, <laughs> as usual. So thank you. So today, um, everyone, we're trying to discuss uh, a very uh, interesting topic, uh, live topic, actually, because um, in March 25th, uh, we have the new commercial law of Ethiopia that has been unanimously approved by the parliament. So we're gathered today uh, to actually uh, talk about the context generally from a um, commercial uh, code of Ethiopia, uh, and then see um, the impact of the businesses that we have here uh, due to the changes uh, that are uh, now in place, okay? So without further ado, I would like to introduce you uh, to our panel. Uh, so starting maybe uh, from uh, the right side. So Mr. Tamaru Wendemagging, thank you for being with us today. Um, so we have um, Mr. Tamaru with a, a huge extensive experience in business law in Ethiopia. That will give us a, a great context uh, and background uh, around it. Next, we have uh, Mr. Murat Ablul. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, so Mr. Muratab is the founder and principal at Muratab uh, uh, Lul Associates, Emily. Uh, then, uh, normally from our plan, we, we were having Dr. Gideon, but uh, we sincerely apologize because uh, Dr. Gideon couldn't make it uh, today um, due to the logistics issues. Um, but we're honored to have uh, Mr. Thomas Gentlahun from EIC, uh, Deputy Commissioner. And then, of course, last but not least, <laughs> our president of Amsham Ethiopia, uh, Ermias. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, Ermias will also be the moderator uh, of this uh, panel. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, so without further ado, I would like us to uh, start off with a keynote speaker, um, who's going to be Scott Ainer from uh, President uh, US Africa Business at the American Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Greetings, my name is Scott Eisner, Senior Vice President for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and President of the U.S. Africa Business Center. To the American Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, U.S. and Ethiopian government officials, members of the AmCham community, all protocols are observed. It's my pleasure to bring you virtual greetings to you from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington and to extend you a belated but heartfelt Happy Africa Day during this week of commemoration. I'd like to thank AmCham General Manager Hannah and Board President Ermias for the invitation to offer a few prepared remarks today. I wish the circumstances would allow me to be there with you in person at the Sheraton. It's a venue we know quite well, having spent many a nights there over the last decade. I join you in not only wishing for a swift end to the COVID-19 global pandemic, but an equally swift return to the health of our countries and a rebound in economic activity that enables businesses like yours to be part of the bedrock of your communities and growth that is essential to our nations. Indeed, one of my last pre-pandemic trips was to Addis in July 2019 for the center's board of directors meeting, which included an audience with many senior government officials, interactions between the US Chamber and the AmCham, as well as a briefing by the president of the country. Much has changed during that time, including the inauguration of a new president of the United States, President Joe Biden, who has signaled an early commitment to re-engage with, with America's African partners. The current circumstances of the pandemic notwithstanding, the US, and the US Africa Business Center sees this as a moment of opportunity. As I'm sure you're aware, in an address to the African Union earlier this year, President Biden spoke of a shared vision for a better future that includes growing trade and investment that advances the prosperity of the United States and African nations. During these remarks, his first speech to an international forum, 
he emphasized that the U.S. was ready to be a partner in the solidarity, support, and mutual respect. Our U.S.-Africa Business Center outlined a series of recommendations from the business, business community that highlighted five ways in which President Biden can take concrete steps to renew America's relationship with the continent and therefore support enhanced economic partnership through his administration's policy engagement. The five recommendations are to make Africa engagement a presidential priority, including hosting U.S.-Africa Leaders Forum and Business Forum as soon as feasible. We need to create coherence on U.S.-Africa trade to include continued negotiations with Kenya on the free trade agreement while pursuing a more modern, comprehensive approach to trade with the African continent, including capacity building to support trade agenda at the African continental free trade area. We need to deepen and expand progress so the whole of government approach to the United States to enhance the competitiveness of the business community in, the, in Africa, including a focus on trade facilitation, science-based regulatory cooperation, and intellectual property enforcement. We need to enhance the role of U.S. funded capacity building to strengthen the position of U.S. interests at multilateral fora on the continent. And finally, we need to engage African governments on policy and regulatory best practices that support the growth of the digital economy and digital trade. In the Ethiopian context, our AMCHAM, just like the U.S. Chamber, is dedicated to strengthening the economic and trade ties between the United States and Ethiopia and supporting efforts that create conditions to unleash growth and opportunity that are indispensable partner in that effort. Ethiopia continues to be a country that is a priority for the United States and a priority for the private sector. Nevertheless, we are cognizant of the difficult circumstances in northern Ethiopia and we offer the private sector's hope that a peaceful resolution can be achieved, lest it have negative impact to the country's citizens and the nation's economic and commercial priorities. We know one of those priorities you will all be discussing as part of the executive breakfast will be the new Ethiopian Commercial Code, representing a much needed update to the regulations that have been in place for more than 60 years. These reform efforts were of interest to our members earlier this month when we were pleased to host Ethiopian Ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Fitzum, for a diplomatic briefing. If those conversations were any indication, I know that you will have an equally robust dialogue today. So let me again by thanking Hannah for her leadership of ANCHAM and Hermias for his wise counsel on the board. I appreciate the opportunity to brief you from Washington and to offer my support for today's proceedings. I look forward to the opportunity to sit down with you in person to share some in Jura and have a great time. Thank you very much and have a terrific meeting. Excellent. So, good morning to you all, uh, and thank you, uh, Salam, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, Hanna, for making this happen. Uh, hopefully, this is one of many to come. Uh, we're hoping with Hanna's leadership at Cham uh, uh, to have uh, many sensitive uh, and commercially uh, pertinent issues uh, to be explored, discussed, and uh, uh, debated uh, in, the, in the many um, discussions and the forum uh, scheduled ahead of us. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be meeting again. Uh, thank you all of you for making the time, both our AMCHA members and guests, uh, distinguished uh, officials who've joined us today. Uh, we hope uh, you'll be able to join us on, on the other events we have scheduled ahead. They're all, uh, the, the, the intent behind uh, in this forum is to ensure that we get uh, this opportunity where uh, we get uh, the sea level uh, uh, leadership to come and explore ideas openly um, so that we are aligned with the changes that are um, uh, going on at the moment and in the time ahead. Uh, that said, Today's topic is pro 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 prominently focusing on the, the commercial code, the new commercial code. Uh, as you have all heard it time and time again, it has taken six decades to, to, to review and uh, to, to, to take a reset on, on the overall framework. So I take a, a huge honor to, to have amongst ourselves Atutamru, uh, Atumratab, and uh, Dr. Tamaskan, 
uh, amongst ourselves, really all uh, with 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 uh, absolutely impeccable reputation in in this space. Uh, Tutamaru, uh, uh, as Han uh, Salam introduced earlier, has been uh, uh, a practicing uh, practicing lawyer for many years. He was in the Supreme Justice. So uh, once again, I'm going to ask uh, each one of our panelists to to take uh, uh, just a short introduction to you, so that you know uh, uh, and uh, you understand a little bit of the background. Uh, once we do uh, that introduction, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, identified some core topics for our discussion this morning, and uh, we'll we'll go um, to that uh, uh, straight away. So I will start with you, Atutamru. Give us uh, a quick intro of uh, you know what you do, uh, where what your practices, your your many years of experience, etc. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. It is really a great honor uh, to be invited at this August assembly and uh, introduce myself and my practice uh, 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 to uh, uh, this August assembly. Uh, I, by and large, I am a career judge. Uh, I started my legal practice uh, as a judge at the High Court, and then, of course, Vice President of the High Court of Ethiopia, and then finally Vice President of the Supreme Court of Ethiopia. Well, in my days, uh, the progress uh, was from uh, the bar to the bench, but um, at the end of the day, this practice was reversed, and the practice became from the bench to the bar. That has to be reversed, and judges must be encouraged to continue in their old days in the judiciary, and I hope the next generation will uh, follow that kind of practice, because the life of law is one of, uh, is not, is one of experience and not one of logic, and experience this with experienced lawyers. Uh, now, I am in the legal practice. I have started, I have, of course, uh, worked very hard to bring the LLP system, the limited liability system in this country, and incorporate the legal practice so that the legal practice will continue or will survive the legal practitioner. Up to now, that is not the case. So I can say, Lawyers started their legal practice way back in 1942 in Ethiopia. Up to this date, there is nothing that the Ethiopian uh, lawyer has contributed to the Ethiopian jurisprudence. That has to be reversed in such a way by, uh, that the, the, the judge will be survived by the corporate state. And that is what I'm trying to do. So Tamru and Maginu Law Office, in cooperation with Bonelerdi, is poised to do that, and we have advanced a long way. Thanks God, the new law will be implemented very soon, and we will all register our law firms and surrender our individual practice and pass all this to the corporate entity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Atamru. Congratulations. Atamru Tab. A quick intro into your firm, your practice. Thank you, Hermes. Uh, my name is uh, Mehra Tablul. I am the managing partner for MLA, a leading uh, corporate law office based here in Addis Ababa. Uh, in addition to my position as a managing partner for the firm I'm leading, I also sit in the DLA Piper Africa Group Board. I am sure most of you know DLA Piper is an international law firm uh, having offices in all the big cities uh, on the planet. And I sit on the Africa Group board. Although we are affiliated with DLA Piper Africa Group, we also work with all the big international law firms. We have a relationship firm status uh, with all the big names you know in the legal practice. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, 
core expertise, I would, I would like to say my, my core competence is on financial services law, more specifically on project finance. And in this regard, in MLA, currently we're doing uh, a couple of uh, project finance assignments where the private sector, in collaboration with the government, is trying to develop some infrastructure projects. So I think that would be in a Wonderful, okay. wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Murata. Dr. Damaskin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Thomas Gentlahon, the Deputy Commissioner at uh, the Ethiopian Investment Commission. Uh, currently in charge of the Investment Operations Division, but have been uh, working at uh, the Commission for the past three years as an investment uh, facilitator, I can say. I mean, I'm not as expert as some of the lawyers here, but have been uh, there facilitating all foreign investment-related services in all the three divisions uh, at the Ethiopian Investment Commission. Probably, I mean, it's not a good uh, platform to introduce uh, what uh, the Ethiopian Investment Commission is, because you all, of, all of you know what we do, what our uh, mission is. So probably I will be answering questions in relation to uh, whatever policy thinking is behind the reform happening uh, in Ethiopia and some of the practical, legal, and policy-related changes that we are implementing at uh, the Ethiopian Investment Commission, based on your questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. Good. So, in terms of the format of our discussion, uh, so as you can see, we have uh, uh, Thomas Gunn here with uh, hands-on experience on the uh, investment side, uh, dealing with the challenge of registering a business and day-to-day -day operational matters. So, we'll we'll come to that. We have prominent lawyers in uh, in corporate affairs uh, that will be able to discuss some of the pertinent issues that you, our members, and uh, other business associates know very well and that with a, a wealth of experience. So we'll try to cover this, hopefully, uh, uh, in the next hour or so. I'm mindful of time. They may have other schedules. Uh, apologies again this morning because of the road closure and all other issues. Uh, we, we, we delayed uh, slightly uh, later. But uh, in addition to some of the uh, startup or uh, firing up uh, questions, I'll come to the floor uh, for you to, to be able to ask and uh, interact with uh, the panelists. So to get started, Atut um, Amru, if, um, if you could um, kindly take us back on the, con the historical context of uh, the Commercial Code of Ethiopia 1960, uh, you know, given your, your, uh, your uh, reputation, your engagement in the law and the practice for so many years and decades. Uh, how did it begin? Where was it? What was its weaknesses? Um, please um, uh, tell us a little bit of uh, the, uh, the historical context. Thank you, my friend, uh, Hermes. Um, uh, sometimes reputation is misleading. I think the test of the pudding is, the, is in the 80. <laughs> Uh, so, I, I feel a bit over-exaggerated, but uh, with that in mind, I will try to shade some lights on the history of the uh, entire legal system in this country in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, 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 as shortly as possible. As you remember, the, uh, Ethiopia is a victim uh, of the uh, uh, co consuming wars uh, that happened uh, during the, the Second World War. In fact, uh, the first part of the war was conducted in Ethiopia, and Ethiopia managed to restore its independence in 1942. And from that day on, the biggest task for the government was to restore the administration of justice. And the first important legislations were enacted uh, right at the beginning of 1942. And one of those uh, is the establishment of the judiciary, which uh, delegated uh, the entire authority 
of running the Ethiopian judicial system to the British, and which lasted up to 1965. And next to that was the enactment of uh, legal systems. Uh, the legal systems were to be enacted into, into law books, and the issue was uh, sep uh, uh, electing between the so-called common law system and civil law system. The common law system, as you know, is based on precedent, stare decisis, and uh, relies on rich cultural heritage, as is the case in the United, uh, in the United Kingdom and countries that follow the common law system. But for Ethiopia, that kind of luxury is totally unthinkable for two reasons. One, the domestic practice has not been successfully or effectively uh, collected and compiled. Second, uh, we have no association with uh, colonial systems and there is no any inspiration, inspiration from outside. So it is more or less an isolated case. For that reason, the committee that was organized to chair, to oversee the codification of the Ethiopian legal system, 28 of them, 12 foreigners, 16 Europeans, have to sit down and deliberate on this. And finally, they decided to pick experts. These experts were French experts, one from Swiss and three from uh, Paris. And these were very renowned uh, uh, lawyers in private uh, international law and comparative law at very reputable universities. And then came the next issue, and that is um, how to go. Shall we pick the common law system or the civil law system? And if the common law system, is it going to be a cut and piece? best sort of thing, or can we make it in as much as possible uh, sound Ethiopian? And then they finally decided, okay, let's go for the court system, but the court system will not be uh, uh, either British or uh, uh, French. It will be eclectic, meaning combining the best of all these things. And therefore, uh, they uh, also collected uh, the just judgments given in Ethiopia, 1,000 of them, and they went through them, and they started to discover the content of justice in Ethiopian perspective. And they came in a very good conclusion, and now they embarked on uh, enacting uh, writing down the laws, the courts. And the first, uh, one of those very important courts is the commercial court, which is revised, with B, which is being revised today. By the way, this court is not based on custom. It is more or less technical, and therefore there is no conflict, because there is no very mature legal practice in Ethiopia that really dealt with uh, uh, trade matters, or company matters, or um, bankruptcy matters. And uh, by and large, uh, these laws were scientific. In fact, the concept of court is generally more scientific, more philosophic than the, uh, the common law system. And therefore, um, uh, they uh, compiled a book that is neither European nor uh, uh, British and in as much as possible reflective and useful uh, to the realities of Ethiopia. It survived for 60 years. It remained resilient for one very important reason, because it is a combination of five books and it is not easy to amend five books at one time. And therefore, many governments tried to, to, to amend it. They all failed. Now, this time, uh, I was also I'm a member of the uh, uh, 
legal advisor and counsel of the Attorney General, and we opted for a system where each of these books should be treated separately and being amended. That made the commercial code vulnerable, and today three of the books are amended, two are waiting, and very soon I hope they will be amended too. That is what I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tamburu. Very enlightening backdrop for our discussion. So, uh, continuing into um, this, uh, maybe, Atomura Tab, if we can go into what is the rationale behind uh, the changes, you know, okay, we have had it for 60 odd years, uh, business has not quite flourished uh, as much as it's, uh, it could have done in Ethiopia. So, so what's the rationale? Uh, and what 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 is covered on uh, in in the new code? So maybe we can start with the rationale behind it. Okay, okay. The, thank you, Hermes. Uh, Ato Tamru has uh, given us a very good context on how originally the commercial code was drafted, and uh, as you heard, that took place uh, sixty plus years ago. And uh, we know what has happened in Ethiopia in the last 60 plus years. Uh, you know, during the imperial days, the private sector was a little bit uh, growing and fledgling, but we had the 1974 revolution. And then, uh, you know, uh, the private sector uh, was almost non-existent. I remember some of the laws during the dark times say, the uh, limit for capital was 50,000 Ethiopian, which was nothing. So the commercial code, the commercial code didn't get the chance to be fully implemented and tested uh, for these various uh, historical reasons. But in the last, in the last uh, I would say 30 years, the private sector has started to flourish again. And uh, I always say in my conversations and in my meetings with clients, you know, private sector in this country has a history of the last 30 years. You know, if you check, go and see the biggest members, front runners in the Ethiopian private sector, you know, they don't have much history longer than 30 years for many of them. But in the last 30 years, this commercial word, uh, commercial code was being tested and gaps were identified. Gaps were identified, and I, I would try to reflect on these gaps identified, and which necessitated the revision of this uh, commercial code. The first, the first gap identified was compatibility with sectoral laws. Uh, Hermes, you can help me on IFRS, which was uh, recently passed as a law, and we introduced a new accounting standard for businesses, but that was alien to the commercial code. So, the commercial code need to be compatible with this uh, law. Another area uh, in terms of uh, sectoral laws is there is a business registration law passed, uh, I don't know, the last seven, eight years, proclamation number 980, and there are requirements. There are requirements on business registration, and in this regard, again, the commercial code was not compatible. So this was the first uh, gap identified. The other gap identified in the commercial code was uh, lack of uh, uh, sufficiently protecting minority interests in the business. Uh, and uh, this uh, lack of proper protection for minority shareholders, you know, uh, creates practical problems and uh, it also goes beyond that and uh, is also one of the factors in the World Bank ease of doing business uh, criteria. And I remember attending uh, ease of doing business sessions and the big, big area where Ethiopia was lagging behind was on minority shareholders protection. So now that has been addressed. That has been addressed and that was another gap uh, identified. Uh, the other area, the other gap identified in the previous commercial code and which necessitated uh, the um, uh, revision was lack of clarity of application of a scheme of arrangements uh, section of the code and lack of protection of investors to enable a company to survive. 
uh, as we may delve into deeper into the coming discussions as to the contents of the revised commercial code, this is an area where we had a very profound revision and change and major departures in the law. You know, businesses should not uh, be always uh, led to declare bankruptcy. If there are, a ch there are chances for businesses to survive uh, based on the restructuring or a scheme of arrangement, these were alien concepts in the previous commercial code, but now in the revised commercial code, uh, these new concepts are introduced and, you know, if businesses are struggling, they can uh, reinvent and reposition themselves as assisted by the law. Um, so uh, these were some of the gaps identified and uh, I think in the upcoming discussion we may yeah. look to some of these uh, Thank you. changes. Thank you, Muratab. I think that's... It's a very interesting rationale. It's uh, uh, issues that we are all familiar with in the business, um, both in terms of uh, setting up a local business or uh, to the majority of our members who are of, uh, uh, from uh, uh, FDI uh, community. So, now what, Thomas, is there anything uh, that uh, you've experienced it on your day-to-day -day interaction in terms of facilitating investment in Ethiopia. How, how has the law and the commercial code restricted or limited uh, the investment potential that you've observed over the years? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, of course, I mean, uh, for us at the Investment Commission, uh, it's not uh, that direct really relevant to raise the commercial code and its impact on the overall uh, things we do, but it's about looking how it's making uh, business doing in Ethiopia convenient. I mean, the whole picture uh, that the commercial code is a part changing in Ethiopia. So uh, the philosophy, as has been presented by uh, the two colleagues, is uh, the political, the economic, reorientation or the change in policy by the government to give uh, priority and bring the private sector into the center of uh, economic activities. Uh, this uh, political decision, political economic decision, is the one that led the government to uh, look after the laws that has been there uh, to consider uh, government-related activities to be on the top of economic activities. So for us at the Ethiopian Investment Commission, of course, uh, oftentimes investors ask that our ease of doing business ranking is not good. And at the same time, but when we ask them back saying that, but still Ethiopia is a very top investment destination, they say that if we improve some of uh, the things, we could have done more. And uh, of course, the inspiration from the questions and dialogues and requests from our investors inspired changes across uh, the country as part of the, the overall political reform happening uh, in the country. So the changes in the commercial court, some of them mentioned uh, by uh, Meretab, are affecting us directly. Uh, for example, the status, the rank uh, of Ethiopia in ease of doing business world bank ranking might improve in the coming year significantly. And also uh, related interventions as part of these of be doing business uh, uh, entries, uh, digitization process and online service provisions. And the fact that we have also improved the investment proclamation and the new regulation is there and related directives in relation to a number of uh, entry points in the law are being introduced can make Ethiopia much more convenient for doing business than before. So it is part of the overall bigger change that's happening in the country, which is actually making us to be uh, more convenient for businesses and attractive destinations for uh, foreign direct uh, investment. As a matter of fact, I believe personally that the changes in the commercial code can benefit more to the domestic uh, companies than the foreign ones. I mean, uh, this is my opinion I and mean, from the top of my mind, but still I believe that there are things that foreign companies can also exploit from the changes happening 
in the commercial court. It's very uh, enlightening to know that we have still to change the remaining three or two books. Uh, but I believe that now it is very uh, critical for us to introduce and technically explain which particular parts of the commercial code are very much relevant to the foreign direct investment community, technically and support and advise and guide on how they can exploit and benefit more and invest, reinvest and expand their investments uh, in Ethiopia. But uh, currently it is of course a, a significant change that is boosting our confidence into saying that Ethiopia still is a convenient destination for uh, foreign direct investment. And, and uh, maybe in terms of uh, the compatibility with sectoral laws, is there anything that you uh, anticipate will bring a quick, uh, quick wins on the ground? Yeah, and, uh, right. That's a very important uh, question. I mean, uh, the rationale behind is lack of compatibility between among laws, uh, sectoral laws. This is, this is a topic that we should keep an eye on and somehow try to reconcile uh, some of our policies, uh, directives, and proclamations across sectors. I mean, it's clearly stipulated on uh, the homegrown economic reform agenda that we are now uh, focusing on five major uh, uh, sectors uh, of the economy, agro-processing, uh, manufacturing, uh, ICT, mining, and tourism. And all the laws there, uh, previous laws, regulations, should be seen in light of uh, the overall legal changes happening both in the commercial court as well as in the investment law and proclamation that is being uh, uh, implemented now. We are observing some specific incompatibility issues practically still. on the ground still. Uh, still. Still, we need to work uh, hard to do uh, more reconciliation among mm. and across Thank our you. laws. Actually. And, and Atutamburu, is there, given your experience over the, over the years, how, how has the the bankruptcy procedure, for instance, has impacted or limited business to flourish in Ethiopia. Again, f emphasizing on the rationale behind the change. Well, I think that's a very interesting question. <laughs> that's a very interesting question uh, because uh, there are certain things which I remember very vividly. When I was uh, first appointed as a High Court judge, a young uh, uh, graduate from the law school way back in 1970, uh, uh, there, there, very, very, there were no, literally, there were no cases that appeared for bankruptcy. I remember one case that appeared for bankruptcy when uh, just before uh, the military regime uh, 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 effected the, 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 the coup d'etat, the revolution. So in effect, bankruptcy was not often used for two reasons. One, the companies that were in Ethiopia, very small one, Two, neither ju the judiciary nor the legal practice had the experience to conduct that uh, sort of legal luxury. And down the road, there were very few cases that, did, that go for bankruptcy. Um, I think right here, uh, just to address the most important points mentioned by my, my colleague Murat Ab in the Tunisia, I may have to highlight one very important point. Uh, for us to grow, for us to develop a reliable legal system, we need to have two important things. That is stability and the continuity. The stability in the, uh, the various professions and continuity in the uh, government uh, administration. The judiciary has to be stable and continuous. Very sad to say that nothing is stable in Ethiopia. 
you have a certain class of judges right now, and you find them thrown out tomorrow. So judges do not develop a skill that makes them more confident, that makes them review the law in such a way as to make it, as to make it consistent with international realities and business requirements. That is lacking. That is one. Another important thing is, of course, we also remained secluded even from our neighbors. We never intermixed with, well, I mean, uh, there are systemic differences in the first place. Kenya, Sudan, uh, Tanzania, they have their own independent legal system, which is linked to their colonial past and which is very important. We supported them, of course. But ours is unique. And we use also our language. That has secluded us. So we have to break that and then break, bring our legal system, our judicial, our legal practice with our uh, corresponding uh, professionals. And that is, I think, the most, one of the most important solutions. I cannot say that that is the only solution, but it helps. But I know the most incomplete part of the commercial court was the bankruptcy provision, the part bankruptcy section. And we have not generated or uh, developed very skillful uh, experts in that area. And even the legal practi practi uh, practitioners were not experts. They were jumping from case to case. The art of knowing more and more about less and less has never been practiced in Ethiopia. It is just starting now. So we have to put that. That is the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Atstamur. It's really interesting, very educational. So we have a backdrop. We know where we come from, the, the legal framework holistically. Uh, we also understand that you know the rationale behind uh, resetting the commercial code in terms of uh, bringing in more economic development, global competitiveness, etc. So, um, in terms of going to the next phase of our discussion, maybe Atom Ratab, can you get into and dive into the key departures? What are the changes, and how how should the business community? Um, uh, identify or utilize these key changes from your perspective. Okay, thank you, Hermes. Uh, let me start by presenting the contents of the revised commercial code. The 1960 commercial code uh, had five books, five books. So now the revision is on book one, book two, and book five. The two books, the law of carriage and insurance, law of negotiable instruments and banking were not revised. So the information we have from the Office of the Attorney General is these two books are being revised separately, separately, and very shortly we will have, like the revised commercial code, we'll have the revised financial code, financial code. So we're going to have a separate code for the currently not revised two books of the commercial code. Uh, Uh, saying this, uh, let me e e give you some information on uh, what are the major departures, the major departures from the previous commercial code under the revised commercial code. The first major departure is the expansion of commercial activities. If you check the previous commercial code under Article 5, it used to list restrictively, restrictively it used to list uh, trade activities, but the new revised commercial code uh, expanded this list very much. So when we go to our regulators, uh, starting from the Ethiopian Investment Commission and ask for uh, business license or investment permit, the restriction is now very much relaxed, uh, very much relaxed. Uh, another major uh, departure is ex Exclusion of small scale works from the scope of the code to be regulated under a separate law. Okay, thank you. Now you can, uh, we also have the slides here so you can see the second bullet point. So, uh, startups, 
startups and SMEs, you know, the formal regulatory framework is too much work. It's too much work. So the new commercial code makes an exception to that effect and uh, uh, is more friendly for SMEs, you can say. Another uh, major departure, another major departure you have in the revised commercial code is the recognition of holding companies. This especially, um, it's, not, it's not a big, it was not a big problem for the FDI community, but for local businesses, when you expand, you have a real estate company, you have a construction company, you have a trading company, but how are you going to handle the corporate governance of these different businesses? It would have been much easier if you have a holding company. And that was a very big gap in the previous commercial code, but under the new code, a holding company concept is recognized, and this is to the relief of uh, front runners, local businesses, you know. Uh, big companies engaging in the different sectors of the economy without having a holding company was a big headache, so not that, that problem uh, has been solved now. Uh, another uh, major departure uh, in the new commercial code is making it consistent with the federal structure. Uh, prior to 1991, I don't know, Gato, you can help me. When was the constitution adopted? 1991, EPRDF came in. 80, 90, 4, 5, 95. Since 95, Ethiopia is a federal country, having a federal structure, having a federal structure. So the commercial code was uh, enacted when we had a unitary state, when we had a unitary state and it was not compatible with the federal structure. So a ma another major departure in the revised commercial code is make, especially in the commercial register, making it compatible with the current uh, federal structure. Uh, as I was saying minutes back, uh, compatibility with the sector laws was uh, a major consideration in the revision of the commercial code. Uh, here you can talk about the financial reporting proclamation, the uh, IP laws. IP laws also have their own requirements, so the commercial code was not compatible in that regard. Competition was uh, another area where the commercial code had a huge gap. Uh, I remember some years back I was attending a meeting like this and I heard the competition guys talking, which was a new concept to our market. We, we never had a competition authority in this market. So it was a recent development in this market, but because the commercial code was enacted many years back, it was not compatible with these uh, latest developments. And as I was also saying, the commercial registration and licensing proclamation number 980-2016 have its own requirements. Again, there was compatibility issues that has been addressed and the new, the new code is uh, very much compliant to that requirement. Uh, in, in, when you go to Mr. Tamaskan's office, the EIC or the Ministry of Trade and ask for licenses, business licenses, they issue business licenses based on what they call industrial classification document, which is a very, very critical document in, for the Ethiopian regulator. So there was, there was a problem in that regard in the previous commercial code and that, that issue has been addressed uh, in the revised commercial code. Another major departure is uh, making it compatible with the Movable Securities Rights Proclamation, 1147-2020. This is uh, a fundamental, a very profound uh, legal change uh, in the Ethiopian market, the Movable Securities Proclamation. You know, uh, uh, there were uh, unaddressed, unregulated issues in terms of uh, creating security rights over movables. Uh, I'm not sure, but it was with the help of World Bank and IMF, we were able to come up with this new proclamation and that have uh, changed a hell lot of things. And the commercial code also, uh, the new revised commercial code is made compatible uh, with these new developments. Uh, another uh, change in the law of uh, business organizations is we used to have ord what we call ordinary partnership. Uh, where uh, a skill can be contributed, 
And with the latest developments, we don't need that ordinary partnership, and that has been uh, abolished. Uh, in addition uh, to the credit of Ato Tamru, I would say uh, LLPs, LLP, Limited Liability Partnership, which is a new concept in our market, and that has been introduced in the commercial code. And uh, if you see the big international law firms, you take DLA, you take Baker McKinsey or uh, Freshfields, all the big law firms are created as LLPs. And that was a big gap in our code, but the new commercial code recognizes uh, this. Uh, another major departure in the new commercial code is uh, when it comes to in-kind contribution, the requirement of having expert valuation. If I'm contributing a building or if I'm contributing some uh, equity contribution in-kind, how, how is that valuation going to be done? There were some gaps, but in the new commercial code, there is a requirement of expert valuation, which is, which is a very good and commendable positive move. Uh, another area, I think, uh, to the interest of, I would say, to the FDI community and members of the AMCHAM is uh, uh, major change where non-shareholders can be board directors. You know, we'll say uh, GE is a client and GE wants to have uh, a board director. We read the commercial code and say, Mr. GE, you can have directors only who are shareholders and the shareholders are not in town. So that was a big, big gap. Uh, sometimes the shareholders might not have the required expertise, uh, the required uh, professional background. So that was a big limitation for the governance of companies. But now, the commercial code, there is a, a percentage limitation. It should not exceed one third of the board directors. But non-shareholders can be uh, directors to the companies. And this is, uh, I would say, to the relief of uh, the members of the FDI community. Another area, another area uh, where there is a major departure is recognition of board of directors for private limited companies. Uh, if you check the practice uh, in DARA, the Document Authentication and Registration Agency, I'm not a big fan of that office. It's, it's, it's You're a not the only one. Going there. Huh? You're not the only one. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of all, uh, that office, and that office need to be reformed, but they had a dual practice. For some companies, as a PLC, they would allow, they would allow a board of directors. Mm -hmm. When you read the commercial code, the commercial code doesn't recognize mm -hmm. board of directors uh, for a private limited company. But in most parts of the world, having directors for companies is uh, a no-brainer. That's a basic thing. But the law was not recognizing that. But now, under the revised commercial code, which I would consider as a major departure, private limited companies can have a board. So now it's not uh, the discretion of DARA to allow me to have a board or not. The law recognizes my right. Um, th there is also some change on the uh, share companies, the roles, duties, and benefits of promoters, founders, and directors. Uh, another major uh, departure is a company secretary required mandatorily for limited liability public companies. The concept of company secretaries was, I would say, very much alien to our system, but now it has become a legal requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, another major uh, departure is we used to have uh, two sets of documents in creating a company. We would have the memorandum of association and then would also prepare articles of association. That's no more a requirement. If we have the memorandum of association, that's enough. Under the new law, there is no requirement of having the um, articles of association. Uh, the concept of partnership agreement under the revised code is replaced with uh, the memorandum of association. Another uh, major, major departure is the introduction of the concept of supervisory board. I don't know, uh, friends from Germany, which, uh, you know the supervisory board concept is very popular in the German legal system where you know the operation of the company would be uh, in the hands of the management and the board, but shareholders may need a supervisory board. That is uh, a continental Europe concept. 
and sometimes say the labor could have a representation in the supervisory board. This was uh, not recognized under our law, but the new commercial code recognizes the concept of supervisory board. Again, uh, this is a very uh, positive and commendable development in the new commercial code. Uh, requirement of having uh, a website for uh, limited liability companies is uh, again a major development in the uh, new commercial code. The group companies, I talked about that, uh, it's, it's a, a wonderful development uh, in the new commercial code. Uh, in terms of minority investors proclamation uh, protection rights, I, as I was saying, that was a big gap in the, in the previous commercial code, especially on ease of doing business. I remember attending World Bank sessions. Always, as Ethiopians, we were, we were challenged. You know, your laws were not giving enough protection for minority shareholders. That has been addressed. And as uh, Mr. Tamesgan was saying, on Ethiopia's ranking on ease of business, after the promulgation of the commercial code, we would have uh, a better rating. So this uh, protection of minority shareholders uh, right is uh, handled uh, by transparency requirements and disclosure requirements, uh, which would give much protection to the minority shareholders. Another uh, big bottleneck, especially in our private practice, was, uh, say, conducting shareholders' meetings or board meetings. I work as a company secretary for the, some of the major companies in this market, and, you know, our laws require physically you have to be in Addis. We can have the meeting only then. So, you know, especially the foreign investors coming from modern jurisdictions, this is archaic. Why are you requiring me to come to Addis? That was a big challenge to us and uh, get to practicing with me in our corporate team. But now the new commercial code recognizes virtual meetings. You know, board of meetings can be done uh, virtually. Uh, Zoom or Teams uh, meetings are recognized under the law. Shareholders meetings can also be uh, conducted in a similar way. And, uh, you know, you can't, uh, you can't, uh, see as a, this as a problem of the previous commercial code and say 60, 70 years back, we cannot talk about technology and having uh, virtual meetings. But the big problem, the big problem was we were not updating our laws following the changes in the market. So we, there were attempts to revive the commercial code, but uh, uh, no attempt was successful to pass through the parliament. And Imagine not achieving that for the last 60, 70 years. That was a huge gap. But now, to the delight of especially the foreign investor community here, virtual meetings are recognized. You know, uh, I would have been much happier to see Dr. Gerdion here <laughs> because we are desperately waiting the publication of the commercial card. Under the law, it is a requirement that it would be binding once it is published. Now, the parliament has passed this as a law, but to be a binding law for businesses, it has to be published. So we are desperately waiting its publication. I remember uh, one of the directors in the office of the Attorney General in his uh, social media post showed us uh, a sample book and said the publication is underway. We are desperately waiting for that. Once it is published, virtual meetings Thank are uh, legal. So these are some of the major uh, changes. I don't know if there are questions. I would yes, be happy yes, to. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, Commercial Code 101 class, so uh, it's very, very enlightening. Thank you so much. Uh, a whole lot of change. Just so that the panel is aware, uh, I'm going to come to you, Dr. Tamaskin. We have uh, um, some of the distinguished investors from Dangote. We have uh, from DAR, uh, is a global uh, conglomerate of businesses. Uh, we have Boeing, General Electric, Radisson, Hyatt, Hilton, and so many of our members are here. Now, given what uh, Atomerat have outlined, there's a lot of exciting changes. How do you see this raising the game for Ethiopian uh, businesses in the, in the global setting? And how would that fit into global expectation? Are we going to be able to read eye to eye with uh, uh, equal partners, equal uh, on equal terms in the global context. 
Thank you very much. I, I really share your ideas that this is really um, an academic class <laughs> to enjoy. Uh, I'm re I really appreciate Pam Chan for creating this opportunity and I would like to promise once again that uh, we will conduct uh, same like sessions for the FDI community to clearly understand departures, I mean the new commercial law, so that uh, our, our FDI community members, companies can uh, make benefit out of it. It's only from knowing what is changed that one can use and one can uh, benefit from it to itself, to the nation as well. So I believe uh, the departures uh, clearly stated uh, by Merata are very important ones. Even I learned myself that today that, I mean, online meetings can be recognized. I mean, un until yesterday we have been asking board members to come and sign on some of the documents and uh, secure their licenses, but it's no more a case after we have uh, that law. And we are also reforming our work permit related, licensing related services to be digital, to be online, virtual, uh, as much as possible to be convenient for our investors, not to make them as such competitive at a local level, but at a regional as well as a global level. For us at the Ethiopian Investment Commission, uh, existing investors are our assets. We don't expect much to come due to the changes from abroad, new ones. You investors here are our basic assets to rely on, supporting you make businesses in Ethiopia and grow and flourish and also conquer Africa and also uh, the world. So being uh, as a facilitator, I mean, I, do, I don't want to say regulator. I mean, Merata has been saying our regulators, but we, we, we believe that we are facilitators more than regulators. I mean, it's not time to regulate FDI this time in Ethiopia uh, because uh, we are in transition. Uh, we are in change. Uh, at Tamru don't like uh, changes that often, but uh, there should be change. There should be change in Ethiopia. I mean, uh, this is a very backward nation. Our laws are, as you see, uh, decades old, and our economy is stagnating due to this. So we need to uh, turn every stone that is blocking our way uh, to development and, and, and growth. So we really uh, encourage uh, companies to clearly understand departures in every uh, legal change, in every uh, policy change. For that, uh, platforms like Amcham and other investors uh, uh, forums are very important uh, to, to, to interact with government bodies, to somehow uh, entertain changes and suggest, and somehow even coerce government to uh, further see uh, somehow uh, transformations, uh, changes in the laws and practices of government bodies. By the way, I would like uh, to accept on behalf of the government, because I believe that I'm the only official here, that you have a complaint on one of the, the institutions, I mean, that way. <laughs> so I will extend the same to the institution because we know, I mean, we feel the, the challenge there for our investors as well. So we really uh, uh, accept. And if you have also a challenge facing, I mean, at EIC, please be frank and tell us. I mean, it's only uh, from your comment that we can improve services uh, uh, as such. So I encourage forums, uh, business associations, to take opportunities to conduct such kind of uh, platforms to further encourage the government uh, transform and change uh, bottlenecks to the development of uh, the nation. And I see the change in the commercial code to be a departure really to help our investors be global, go global and grow more and achieve more uh, working with uh, Ethiopia. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I think. Uh... Uh, I'm really grateful that uh, uh, EIC is represented by Dr. Tamaskan here. Uh, I think uh, he mentioned a very important word. The, the, the audience here is the asset. In fact, uh, we had a, a small meeting uh, amongst the audience. Uh, we've invited uh, Ben from the European uh, uh, Business Chamber. We also have the Indian Business Chamber here. And we had a gathering and we said, we are really the ambassadors of business for Ethiopia because this is where everyone is. 
And truly, this is where you can get genuine feedback on the daily challenge of doing business. And indeed, how many Ethiopian businesses have flourished in Ethiopia and beyond the boundaries of Ethiopia? It's because of the limitation. And myself, uh, nearly 10 years ago, is at Tamru, um, while establishing Zeman Bank, we had the aspiration to open the first branch in Sudan. <laughs> and there was no law, but an exception was made for CBE, <laughs> if you remember us. So this challenge is remain, and the true potential of Ethiopian businesses is still uh, compressed into uh, our boundaries. So thank you, thank you very much, and I think it's uh, we share that uh, opinion that uh, really the, the the business ambassadors are very much here, and is 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 time to uh, collaborate, to listen, to take feedback, and reorient the way we do business. Uh, there's one question uh, Muratab really wanted to raise, uh, with reference to Dar. I think. How many of you have issues with DAR? Please raise your hands. Only this? I thought we were more. <laughs> OK, no problem. Not necessarily to make a big issue, but uh, please. Uh, thank you, Hermias. Uh, I would have been much happier if Dr. Gideon was here, because <laughs> DAR is under uh, Dr. Gideon. You know, as a business lawyer, as a business lawyer, one of the things I hate, Lelena would agree, Git would agree, every lawyer would agree. The one thing we hate is going to Dara because everything they do doesn't make business sense. And let me tell you one uh, interesting story. I was with a client uh, behind a long line. He's from England and he said, he was wearing a t-shirt. Uh, good guys go to heaven and uh, bad guys go to Pattaya. And Muratab, he said, we have to change this t-shirt. Good guys go to heaven, bad guys to go to Dara because <laughs> it's a place to punish people. You know, I work as a company secretary for a UK company and I have seen how we authenticate documents. I sit in the boardroom, I'm the company secretary. We call the notary, the notary comes to the boardroom. We give our documents, we give our documents checks. It's a side meeting in the boardroom, and the document is authenticated, and we finish, we finish everything in that room. Here in Addis, big business executives, you have to go to Dara. They don't come to the business. They, it's not a business-friendly service provision in Dara. And, you know, as I said, as a business lawyer, this is a big, big problem in this market, and it has to change. Document authentication, it has to be simplified. So I'm very happy <laughs> the approach of Mr. Tamaska. That's why I, I'm raising this uh, concern of the business community. Yeah. One thing, he doesn't want to be addressed as a regulator. I'm happy, you know. Yeah. I would uh, change my language and address them as a, faci a facilitator. That is a business-friendly approach. Another thing I liked about Atu Tamaskan is, okay, representing the government, I'm hearing to the problems of the private sector. So Dara is a big problem to the private sector. Things need to change in a business-friendly manner. Document authentication should be a 10-minute process. Why should it be a three days process? A three days process. I'm sure some of you have a bitter experience. So Mr. Tamasgan, this is an assignment <laughs> for you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, yes, that's up. Okay, okay, please. <laughs> I have touched on this point in one article which I wrote. Um, I will tell you the uh, latest development. Uh, when we go and authenticate, we ask for authentication of a, of a power of attorney uh, or uh, delegate uh, a lawyer um, on behalf of our client, they have now started that we have to produce the document in which the auto, our client has renewed its license. This is very funny. There is Ministry of Trade for this. It is not its, 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 its job. You know, for uh, Amharic speakers, I will tell you one very important thing, one, one very important verse in which this was expressed some 30, 40 years ago. 
አገር ሲጠፋ አውቃለሁ ለሁሌ ባንድ ሸለቆ 55 ለሌ if so many people do the same thing there is going to be conflict and there is legality will lose any any sense so i totally conquer with what atomerata have said and i was training and planning to bring this complaint to the office of the attorney general i am very sorry i was a bit tied up but i have written a small article of course uh, i have included this in that article unfortunately nobody reads articles and therefore <laughs> that will still surviving and and going stronger thank you thank you thank you dr tamro i think uh, we all know uh, thank you dr tamas can to note this i think the whole experience of investment has to be simplified it's i think the the effort at eic you know one window service blah 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 fantastic start but uh, the moment we walk out of the door of eic what is the executive's experience down the stream the value chain at dara or various other industries is a totally different setup and it's you know the feedback is here so uh, uh, you know being competitive in in in, uh, in the world uh, bank rating uh, compared to kenya compared to other developing nations these are the sort of experiences if um uh, uh, you know the ceo of boeing or the ceo of ge is uh, subjected to such a situation where one could almost feel the humiliation of having to queue outside that's it, it just doesn't invite investment and i think these are the small things i think the efforts are commendable there's a lot of changes quite honestly in the last 3 years we've seen so many amendments to the various legal frameworks that are coming to play enforcement of that itself is a massive task but uh, the change continues it's a we are 61 years behind the globe <laughs> when it comes to uh, doing business uh, uh, our uh, commercial practices so uh, we await uh, and we hope these changes uh, will continue to impact uh, in making doing business easier in ethiopia so moving on a little bit atomerata uh, you know so all of this discussed and ato uh, tamru i will come to you uh, quickly on holding company structure maybe you will enlighten us uh, some of the impacts but ato mehrata everyone is hearing about the capital markets so uh, there's uh, the capital market authority under under uh, uh, establishment there's uh, the, the the proclamation being written presented to parliament this and that and how is this aligned to the commercial the new commercial code and how is that going to impact our members do you think uh yeah but you know uh, because of uh, time constraint i haven't uh, presented all the major uh, departures in the commercial code and one of the gaps was uh, uh, related to capital markets uh as ermis you pointed out the capital markets uh, draft proclamation i think it passed through the council of ministers and now it's in the hands of parliament so very soon we're going to see a, a regulatory equivalent to the sec the securities exchange commission and we're going to see uh listings markets uh, like the london lse uh, the london stock exchange or the new york stock exchange we're going to see similar markets uh coming to the ethiopian market so with this development the commercial code need to be compatible need to be compatible with this uh, latest developments and uh, one area where there is a major departure is recognition of digital securities digital securities but say, by securities i mean uh, say if you are a shareholder in a company you expect you expect to be issued a share certificate so far the practice was uh you go to the company and the company would give you would give you uh in a paper form the share certificate indicating all the requirements as provided in the commercial code but now 
to make this uh, commercial core compatible with the capital market, digital securities are recognized. So tomorrow, or the capital markets authority, which we're going to have it very soon, if they license any stock market, for securities to be traded in that market, you know, digitally, issued uh, securities are recognized under the new commercial code. So that is one of the major uh, departures here, Yes, I don't know if I have answered yes. this. Yes, thank you, thank you. And, and uh, 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 okay, maybe I'll come on that. But Atut um, on on the impact of the new code when it comes to uh, establishing a holding company, um, you know, this has been uh, an issue. It's been raised uh, a million times over the years. Uh, do do you think uh, this will have a major impact in doing business in Ethiopia, to Um Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, you know, holding company, when the code was enacted way back in 1962, there was only one provision in the commercial code, uh, specifically Article 451, uh, deals with accounts of holding company, that's all. It said that the account will be part of the account of the general company, and the account be consolidated, nothing more. So the concept was there, but the way holding companies were managed, treated, administered, was not at all regulated. Now, I think this part is totally uh, illustrated and regulated in such a way as to be compatible with existing realities in other parts of the world. Uh, to, to be very frank, I have not yet come across uh, a copy of uh, the new draft uh, book. I have only the gist uh, of the amendments. And at this point of time, I may not be able to go deep or to delve into it and tell the specificities. But I can say one important thing, that no more are we limited to a general company on uh, holding uh, company. We are going to have uh, complete details on the administration and management of such companies. I think that is a very welcome gesture. And if Mrata Ab has uh, had access to the details, I invite him to share words on that. Thank you very much. Uh, Azotamuru, uh, before, before you go, and if you have any comment on the class of shares on the new, uh, in the new code. Transfer of shares? Uh, class of shares. Oh. Um, uh, class of shares, as you know, uh, this is also uh, a very important point. In the commercial code, shares, are either bearer or uh, uh, personal shares. Uh, you have uh, bearer shares, bearer shares, and registered shares. Bearer shares are kept always in the pocket of sh the shareholder. This kind of shares used to be issued in the old good days when companies are generally owned by uh, European shareholders. For instance, you have companies like Ito Nippon, which were owned generally by German sh shareholders, and other companies where the major shareholders or the founders are non-Ethiopian by nationality, but Ethiopian by residence. And for this reason, those people were very shrewd to issue better shares. And issuing those better shares and confining the management of the company to uh, foreign dwellers or foreign minority shareholders, those people went to Europe 
and started spend, spending their good day, uh, retirements in Germany, in France, or elsewhere. They don't come here. They simply transfer their shares uh, by air and send uh, amendments or tra transfer of shares, complete it in European uh, notary offices and get it authenticated in Ethiopian notary offices and everything is sealed. Now there is a tentative sort of or tacit sort of limitation in curtailing the issuing of Barrett shares. So most of the shares are uh, sort of personal shares in the name of the shareholder, registered shares. These shares are registered in the registration book and whenever transfer is going to be effected, it will be infected, effected in accordance uh, with the direction of the board and adjusted on the, on the book. Uh, and that really makes life a bit safer than the uh, conditions under uh, better shares. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Samur. Muratab, any, anything you want to add on that? Uh, let me say a few things on the concept of holding companies. Please. Uh, you know, you have operating company, operating company which have actual operational uh, activities. Say it could be a manufacturing company. So that is an operating company. Uh, but the same owners could have another operating company engaged in real estate uh, or uh, in other sectors of the economy, but have actual operations. Now, the concept of, uh, the concept of uh, holding companies you can have all these operating companies under one holding company, under one holding company. So the holding company is not going to be an operating company. It's not going to engage in real estate, manufacturing, or any operating activity, but the very purpose, the very purpose of the holding company would be to hold equity in operating companies. So, uh, still, uh, we, we are working on the draft commercial code. As I was saying, we are waiting the final version of the code, which I will share to Atut Amru. Uh, we have that draft. So uh, we are also educating ourselves on these major developments. We don't expect a holding company to have a business license because it's not going to engage in any business activity, but it would have a registration uh, documents. And the main purpose, the main purpose of this holding company would be to hold equity interest in operating companies. And I can tell you for local businesses who engaged in different sectors of the economy, this is a big, big relief, big relief. And this was a major gap in the previous commercial. Thank code. you. We have uh, an impact investor amongst ourselves. I'm sure we might have a question later. I'll come to you, Matthew, if you have anything. but. Um, in terms of tax treatment, I know we are not uh, particular tax experts. How would the uh, holding structure, et cetera, might impact the tax treatment? Uh, do you want to say anything? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were, uh, you know, uh, when we discussed in our office with uh, my colleagues, Gaitu, especially Dr. Tedes, uh, we have excellent tax lawyers in our office. And uh, Tababa is also another uh, wonderful tax lawyer. So we were having a discussion on the tax liability of a holding company. So uh, if a holding company is going to have only equity interest in another operating company, uh, what happens is the operating company, when it declares its dividend, would be paying its corporate tax would be paying its corporate tax, 30% corporate tax is paid on that money. Then that money, before it is distributed to the shareholders, another tax, 10% dividend tax would be paid, and then it would go to the holding company. So when the money reaches the holding company, we don't see any tax liability because already corporate tax is paid on that money, dividend tax is paid on that money, 
and uh, i don't see i don't see any legal legal justification to assess additional tax on the holding company but still these things are uh, evolving yeah. we know we know erka is erka so <laughs> Uh, how they are going to assess tax, we have to wait and see. But for the time being, this is the way I see it. I think uh, another note to be taken for EIC. Um, we'll say no more on that. Um, now, again, um, very mindful of your time. I know, um, you know, much apologies because of the traffic earlier. Uh, Dr. Gideon uh, sent his uh, apologies at the last minute. He was called into, uh, so we had confirmation from his office until last minute urgent meeting was called into, so apologies from uh, Dr. Gideon. But uh, I would love to continue this discussion. Uh, there are so many things to get into, but I don't want to make it all um, amongst ourselves. I want to open it up to the audience. I'm sure uh, maybe if we can pick uh, three, four questions and then uh, we go uh, to wrap up in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. If, if you can afford me your patience for the next uh, uh, 20 minutes or so, is that okay? Shall we, shall we come to uh, the table? So maybe I'll open up, uh, you know, now uh, we have the historical context. We know the major departures. We see the perspective uh, from EIC in terms of uh, creating a conducive environment for investment. and. And also to consider your input um, as, as a critical asset in terms of uh, uh, bringing in incremental changes to the proclamation and uh, doing business in Ethiopia. So I'm opening, uh, on opening the Q&A session uh, so that uh, we take a few questions. Matthew. Uh, uh, yes, you're loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> so normally I know I would stand up and ask these questions, but I find that uh, since we're in the cohort of the American Chamber of Commerce, uh, we're one of the most active investment firms here in this country. And I'm so excited about the changes that are happening with the commercial code and the investment code. My question is to all of you, but specifically uh, to you, sir, uh, Dr. Weston. Um, When change happens at a policy level, uh, and we want to try to come and take advantage in a good way of that policy change, but down in the rank and file, people are afraid. They don't want to change. So when we come and say, hey, it looks like this sector has been opened. And so then we're coming in and saying, great, let's come in and help this local entrepreneur grow their business. And we get, no, not right now and that company fails and dies as a result of that. How do we, how do we as, a, as a foreign investment group, with all of this good news of change, how do we respond to that? What's the best thing that we can do to help you feel comfortable that we're not here to take over the business, that we're not here to hurt the local private sector? We're actually here to help businesses grow and companies grow and people create jobs, which is really, I'm sure we all know priority number one for this country right now is job creation. So what's your advice to us? I know you hear a lot of our advice to you, um, but as you're rolling these changes out, what can we as Renew Investment Advisors, which are desperately trying to back local companies grow, what can we do to help you roll these changes out more effectively so you feel confident that the private sector is here to be your friend? Tell me that, please. Excellent, Matthew. Thank you very much. Uh, is that Sarah? Sarah, please. Thank you. Sarah Jackson from Verdant Frontiers and Verdant Consulting. A few slightly more legal questions on what, you, especially I think Meritab was discussing. Um, are hold co holding companies really actually going to be useful under this new code? I was talking to one lawyer and they were saying that the Companies, I think, under the holding company would end up losing their limited liability status if they were PLCs, and you would have joint liability across all those companies, which sounds pretty worrying. 
And then second question, classes of shares, will it be possible to have preference shares, A and B shares, will they be recognized? And then timeline for implementation. Um, I'm quite interested in the investment proclam uh, sorry, immigration proclamation, which was years ago, because theoretically under that, I should be able to have permanent residence because I've actually been married to an Ethiopian for 10 years and I don't, I can't. Um, how quickly will all of this be implemented so that we can actually do all these things? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Very good questions. Anyone else? Dr. Hermias. Hello, uh, Dr. Hermias Kapila from Grant Thornton Advisory. Uh, my question is that uh, Ethiopia has improved in its uh, contract enforcement. Uh, that's one of the actual factors and ease of doing business that we've actually improved upon. Uh, how much further does this new commercial code help to strengthen that uh, gain? Who are you directing that to? <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Uh Anyone else? Mr. Devai, you have to ask. You know, this is the opportunity to ask. <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, uh, especially not to get a free legal advice here, <laughs> but uh, uh, I represent DAR uh, group, which uh, we do, uh, we are engineering consultants. And I must say it is a diversified uh, engineering consultant. So, yes, yes. Maybe, maybe you can give us, just in one sentence, what do you do at the moment? Well, we, we have, uh, we are under contract with Ethiopian Airlines doing uh, all the expansion, their hotels and uh, uh, their internal uh, designs and supervision. And we have other projects with uh, different companies also. But one of the challenges that we faced uh, was uh, not directly with Ethiopian in, uh, Investment Commission, but when we were trying to get our license, we, uh, everything went well in the EIC, but when we tried to get a license, they kept asking us our uh, capacity uh, in uh, every single sector that we do. Now, like I said, we are a diversified engineering consultants. We do aviation, we're number one in airports, we're number one in commercial buildings, and so and so on. But they asked us to get one license for water, one license for uh, design for buildings, one license for aviation. We can't do that. Our license is one, and we do everything. And in the new commercial code that Matt, you explained, I think that's one of the changes. Uh, if I remember correctly, on the first slide, uh, number three or four down, it says they recognize this. We've been told that, but in reality, when we try to get our license, we couldn't do it. So we can't wait to get that book of the new commercial code, which hopefully includes that our engineering firm, which basically does almost everything from oil and gas to aviation, from uh, electricity to telecom, and we will not be asked to get a license for every single uh, discipline. I hope that is included. Uh, just to give us context, what's the size of the dollar size of your project at the moment? Just a bold number. Just Well, let's just say we are a multi-billion dollar company. In Ethiopia? Oh, not yet in Ethiopia. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but, uh, but yes, in Ethiopia, that's what we're aiming. I mean, you know, there are so many developments, yeah. big projects, big projects. And uh, we are, I must say, we are after the big projects, not a very uh, small yeah. uh, number, not to compete with really local companies, yeah. but to bring the, uh, the know-how to okay. the local companies. So our, uh, our investment is big. We, we are investing yeah. a lot of yeah. money. I will not uh, 
uh, say the exact amount, but uh, it's uh, quite. Uh, in quite in a three lot. digits, millions. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Masfun. You must have some questions from Naradison. No? Uh, some of it is in the hand of the government, so uh, that's why. But I had a quick chat earlier with Meratab. We both share some of the issues with Erka. With uh, investment, we don't really have any problem. I think I went last time, we're really well uh, looked after, and I really hope they carry on doing that for the future too. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, Jonathan, uh, from Dangote, any, anything you want to ask? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot, Jonathan. It's, no, that's good. You can't uh, hide. Thanks for this uh, platform. It's a good opportunity to get different things that are happening. Um, I think the most important takeaway for me is that there are not a lot of things that we need to just dig deeper into and understand uh, a little bit more. But just one question on the code. One of the big challenges that we have as an organization is that we invested foreign, uh, it's a foreign investment, um, almost 500 million. Uh, part of it is equity, part of it is a loan. So with the devaluation that is taking place, we ending up with devaluation exchange losses, and that's then impacts on the share capital and uh, retained uh, income or accumulated losses structure. Is this issue addressed in the new code coming? on the ratios, especially given the external externality of the issue on the devaluation. Ha, I, I, Jonathan, I this yes. is a, such a sensitive issue. Just, you know, 500 million investment, you're probably one of the largest FDI member on the ground. So how, how impactful is it for your business? Just so that's to give us some context. Well, it, it, it is huge. Uh, partly because it's a, a share stru uh, st uh, ownership structure issue um, in which we made a, obviously a deliberate decision on what amount of that should be share capital and what is a debt which is loan from the holding company. So on the holding uh, company loan, you end up with these exchange losses, huge exchange losses. Um, we are not able to immediately repatriate the loan repayments because of Forex, obviously. Uh, so we basically stuck in this situation unless we convert everything to, uh, to share capital, which is not necessarily in the interest of the investor. And it then impacts future decisions on expansion into the country. Now, Jonathan, again, I, 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 before you sit, I recently heard on the public media, the mass media, uh, Dangote is investing in Sudan. Uh, is that the expansion that was planned for Ethiopia, <laughs> being redirected? No, I think the, the projects in the country are ongoing. ongoing. The feasibility studies, not only in cement, but in other areas, uh, joint ventures, uh, because we are sitting on a local cash which we need to invest in some some projects, so we are looking at other projects. But the big one, which is the expansion of cement capacity, is ongoing and it's subject to a number of uh, issues. Thank you, being thank resolved. you, Jonathan. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Excellent, so uh, again, in the interest of time, I think if there are no more questions, well, let's try to wrap up. Uh, maybe uh, the first one, Dr. Thomas Gunn, Matthew is asking a simple question. You know, how can we ensure, uh, how can we secure your confidence in the investment community that we are genuine partners in doing business in Ethiopia? All right, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for the question. I mean, I really understand uh, uh, what you wanted to say. I mean, uh, look, I mean, this is a very different time in Ethiopia. I mean, uh, history have been presented by Adu Tamru, how we evolved as a government, our history of government, 
uh, is, is somehow, I mean, uh, at the core of the changes now. I mean, it's impacting us every day. The perception uh, and definition we give to what the government does and how it should do, uh, what its role is. I mean, for thousands of years, Ethiopia has been in a monarchical system, followed by a military uh, dictatorship. Now we are trying to implement a different kind of uh, uh, regime or government or ideology, you can say, uh, to somehow give the public a role in the government from establishment to its function. So our history of statehood, government perceptions are affecting changes. So it's very simple to write a law. Experts like Merit Abin that Samru can write you a very wonderful uh, law in a matter of a month or so, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> but you know, implementing such a law on the ground might take time. Changing people's attitude, establishing institutions and cultures takes time. It could be one of the major factors that's affecting us into looking at our clients at every government institution. I mean, we, we don't uh, positively accept requests from the private sector, positively, I mean, like uh, skepticism. I mean, that government is the one to do everything and the private sector is the one to take, snatch things from the government, uh, the people from the government. So such kind of thinking, is, philosophies need, need uh, time to change. So uh, laws are here, implementation of them uh, may, may take some time. Like for example, establishing a well-functioning uh, institution uh, needs a long time effort. Uh, capacity building, I mean hiring uh, professionals that can deliver what is, what is on, on the law. So it may take time, but we are on the right trajectory. Uh, for example, in my institution at EIC, now we have a new proclamation, of course, a new uh, di I mean, uh, directive uh, that is uh, much different from the one we have before. Accustoming it to ourselves, understanding it and well, and operationalizing it into uh, directives, specific directives, and establishing uh, and institutional orders to implement them somehow uh, needs time and resource. But I don't feel that my institution EIC is lagging behind as such. Uh, we are providing services uh, to the level expected, both online and, and in person, uh, in, in a kind of modern way or in a kind of efficient way, I can say. But still, I understand your question about the change from positive listing into a neg negative listing and the fact that we are staggering here and there to understand some of uh, the sectors and requests coming uh, from our existing investors and new ones. But we are working on it. We are working on it so that we can be best in answering requests for investment license on every sector. For example, uh, I, can, I can mention you the aftercare strategies that we are implementing. Before, we were reactive somehow. We only have an investor relationship program where we go to the investor once in a quarter or so. But now we are trying to implement an investor development program which makes us more proactive into supporting our investors, existing ones, understand their concerns, and somehow guide you into using uh, some of the new changes uh, happening. Uh, in government. So I really understand your question and I really, I really, I really appreciate that you are very frank enough to, to present your question this way and we'll work on it. I hope we will improve very soon in delivering what we promised as a government. Thank you, thank you. That's a uh, very earnest uh, change is, has begun. It's going to take time. It's a bit like uh, a software upgrade. So, uh, <laughs> um, so we have the hardware, it's going to be, take some time to, to, to get there. Uh, 
So uh, we're going to be wrapping up just in a few minutes. So um, uh, Atom now, uh, you know, uh, Sarah raised the holding company structure, the, the preferential share treatment, etc. If you have any, any answer for her. Okay, okay, thank you, Hermias. Uh, before uh, trying to address Sarah's question, let me say, uh, let me try to give a very practical advice on the question which was addressed to Mr. Tamaskan, because in, in MLA, we have uh, a, big, uh, a big number of clans, and that's a big challenge for us. We go to EIC. By the way, Mr. Tamaskan, EIC is uh, a different breed compared to the other government offices. You know, the atmosphere in EIC and the atmosphere in other government agencies is entirely different. EIC, you know, it's not because you're here. EIC is a business-friendly government agency, and, you know, they, would, they have open ears to hear what you're saying. So... One practical advice I have to businesses when approaching the Ethiopian civil service and government agencies is resilience. Resilience. You know, you go to the EIC, the people in the front desk, you present a very simple question, they may say no. Don't get frustrated. You go to the higher ups. When you go up the ladder, very easily you can get solution. I can tell you this. Uh, you know, the right person to talk on this uh, subject is Gato in this room, because on a daily basis, that is a challenge for him. So we go to Ministry of Trade, you know, government have wonderful policy, a new law, but when we ask a very simple question, maybe those staffs are not aware of those developments, or they are still stuck in the old days, and they're not uh, willing to change. So the front desk says no, go to the next higher up. Go to the next higher up, you'll get a solution. One thing I, I can tell you, uh, especially if you reach to offices like Mr. Tamaskan's office or to a minister's office, communication becomes much easier. Communication becomes much easier. You can talk the same language, but in the lower strata, still, you know, we have to be very candid. There is uh, a challenge. So the practical advice is, the lower end says no, go to the higher up, you'll get a solution. That's how we're uh, getting our bread and butter and surviving in the business. <laughs> um, on uh, Sarah's question, yes, classes of shares are recognized uh, under the new commercial code. Uh, preferential shares, dividend shares are recognized in the new commercial code. Uh, in the preferential shares, um, you know, some of the shareholders can have preference on dividend distribution. Some of the shareholders could have preference on uh, liquidation of the company. Say, as a foreign, you as a foreign partner are joining a local business. In case of liquidation, you want some preferential treatment. The new commercial code uh, recognizes that. Uh, on the holding company structure, as I told you, it is, we, we are also still learning this thing and how practically it's going to be implemented. But the, what is provided in the draft code is the holding company, the holding company would not be an operating company. Say, I know Dangote's business. Dangote's business, they have a cement plant that is an operating company. But if Dangote tomorrow wants to expand its business and uh, engage in other sectors of the economy, the need may come to have a holding company. So that holding company uh, would be governing the business of the subsidiary operating company. So this is uh, what I can say. Uh, on the issue Dangote representative raised, you know, as a project finance lawyer, I have to say something, you know. Uh, whenever you go to a new market, whenever you go to a new market and try to develop a project, the first exercise to be done is risk identification. So the risk matrix should be done. In that risk matrix, in a project finance context, currency risk is top on the list. Currency risk is top on the list. So once you identify that risk, the next column would be how are you going to mitigate that risk? How are you going to mitigate that risk? Uh, say you have uh, a debt liability to your lenders and that is paid in USD or UK pounds, I don't know. 
when there is a difference between the currencies of the revenue and the debt liability, that is a risk. How is that going to be addressed and mitigated? You know, it, it, it needs some innovative thinking, innovative thinking given your situation. So uh, it's not something without a problem. There could be problems. It cannot be solved 100%, but it could be mitigated substantially. So I think uh, those are the Thank questions. You. Thank you. Uh, so, Astamaru, um, so this is uh, to wrap up. Uh, one, uh, there is a question that Dubai raised about uh, having a single license, if you have any comment on that. Uh, and also, if you have any takeaways uh, for the business community, especially for our members, uh, the American uh, investors uh, and, and uh, the rest of the FDI community. Maybe if you, if you give us uh, uh, three points of wisdom as, as we go forward with these changes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Adrian. Um, I just want to throw some ideas to the really uh, very important uh, point raised by the first by the first person who uh, asked a very interesting question. How can we help you? My advice, my observation, or my answer to that is to invite them to suggest to follow the way the uh, very committed um, really uh, hard-working Americans did when they started the Ethiopian Law School way back in the 1960s. Professor uh, Paul Jane and his uh, uh, professors recruited by him came to Addis Ababa and they were offered one empty house inside uh, the present Addis Ababa University. The house was empty, with no keys. He went there, he broke it himself, and he got in, invited his uh, uh, co colleagues who accompanied him, and they started the law school from scratch. Then he laid the structure and asked his colleagues to work day and night. And they worked. And in 10 years, they turned that empty house into one of the best law schools in the face of the earth. He started the Journal of Ethiopian Law, which is still going on, and obtained important journals from important universities from all over the world and started a fantastic library which is still working. That law school is one of the greatest gifts that the Americans gave to Ethiopia. Don't forget this is an anomaly. We have a court system and the Americans follow the common law system and yet, they trained themselves and became experts. The articles they left behind is cited everywhere. So, I advise the Americans really to guide us, to assist us along that line and develop our legal skill, which is very important. That is all what I can say about the first question. On the second question, which relates to no, your wisdom, uh, takeaways, any, t any takeaways from the changes that have come our way at the present time? Very good. Uh, I think a young nation in terms of uh, what startup, but one of the old nations as a country, we have a lot to catch up. We had a road to learn, and we are along that line. We have students from law school, 
We have so many law schools already. But I think the most important thing that is lacking in this country is developed jurisprudence. That is very important. That settles our life. And I'm sure we need lots of assistance from experts, from experts in business, from academicians, and from scholars, and also from investors. And a combination of that will bail, out, will bail us out from where we are now. That's what I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Atatam. Thank you so much. Muratab, key takeaways for our audience? Yeah. In this regard, I would like to say, because uh, I have uh, seen and witnessed uh, the facts I'm talking about now, a very profound change is underway, I can tell you. I was a member of the working group uh, when the new investment law was drafted uh, under the EIC, and we drafted a new investment law. That has uh, entirely changed the Ethiopian landscape. Uh, from uh, positive listing, we shifted to negative listing. This opens the Ethiopian market very, very widely for the foreign community. Previously, we were positively listing, okay, Mr. Foreigner, these are the areas you are allowed to engage. Now, that is not the approach. The approach is now, Ethiopians, these are the only areas reserved for uh, you as a domestic investor. The rest, it's not positively, the market is open. In our practice, you know, sometimes foreign companies say from Singapore, I remember one time they came and talked about paramedics. Paramedics, you know. They said, this is not a hospital business. Paramedics feed business to the hospital. So we want to be licensed. We went to Mr. Tamaskan's office. The understanding was this is a healthcare. This is a hospital. So. Under the new law, the Ethiopian market is widely open for the foreign uh, community. I also see, I also see uh, a very profound exercise to make Ethiopia a business-friendly jurisdiction and uh, uh, to attract more FDI to this market. So I'm sure with the the cumulative effect of all these exercises would be, Ethiopia would be much different, much different uh, in the near future. So I'm, I'm very happy to see these things. So the software upgrade has begun yes. at EIC. <laughs> Great. Uh, Dr. Thomas, a final few words before I wrap it up, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you once again for organizing such a an exceptional uh, uh, forum. I hope this is the beginning and uh, we'd like to see a better and bigger uh, uh, workshop on different uh, topics uh, of change for the business community. So AIC will partner is, with you in co-organizing such uh, uh, kind Thank of you. platforms. Uh, the second one for you, the audience, I mean, uh, uh, what I would like to say is that the government is ready uh, to uh, any positive change, uh, I mean, initiated from both inside or outside, but it should benefit the Ethiopian people. Our demand is very clear, creating jobs, getting out of poverty as fast as possible. Anything that helps this is a very welcome idea. So we are ready to accept anything from you, our customers. So exploit the changes happening in Ethiopia. A lot is changing at the legal and policy level. So you need to exploit as you are near to uh, the changes, please be the first to benefit. When you benefit, the country benefits. So use the changes, both at the policy level, the privatization and everything and everything, and also the new uh, laws like the Ethiopian investment law, which is making Ethiopia more open to businesses, the new commercial code and innovative ideas there. These are there for you, please use them. Uh, the other thing is my commission on the Ethiopian Investment Commission. Thank you for the appreciation. But still, we need to do more to fill uh, uh, your expectations. We know that there are there are uh, standards that we we, ha we we have to measure ourselves. Uh, global IP IPS are there, which we always benchmark. 
So we still to go miles away to provide a wonderful uh, technology supported, efficient uh, service, predictable service. We are working to that direction. We are digitizing our systems. We are capacitating our commission, including renovating the office to be more convenient for you. Uh, so next time when you come to EIC, you'll see a very clean and green environment to enjoy and also a service to uh, uh, your expectations. So thank you very much once again. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, can I ask all of you to give a round of applause to our panelists, to Tamaru, to Muratab, to Tamaskan. Thank you so much for your patience and for staying and uh, being participating into this discussion. This is uh, the first of many series of discussions that uh, AMCHAM is organizing and uh, Hannah will reach out for your feedbacks. Uh, I hope uh, we will also try to wrap up on this discussion and uh, uh, share um, uh, 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 the points discussed with you via email. Um, I want to say uh, um, thank you so much for being here once again and uh, uh, we look forward to see you at the next session. It will be one month from now. Uh, Hannah will will share the details and uh, the, the the location, etc. Uh, as a, uh, as a point of gratitude, uh, I want to acknowledge our board members and Vice President Hiroki. Can you stand up, Hiroki? Uh, he's uh, the head of Boeing in Ethiopia and. Vice President of the American Chamber. So thank you, Hiroki. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Salam. Can you stand up and uh, uh, receive an up, a round of applause for hosting us? And she will do uh, the final wrap-up point. So over to you, Salam. Promise I'll keep it short. <laughs> We're also approaching lunchtime. Okay, so again, um, not much left to say, honestly. Uh, Irmas, I think you had a, a good wrap-up uh, message. Uh, again, deeply honored to have uh, all the panelists with us today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Tamaru. Uh, great insight, context. I think for me, the key points were really around having a, a better judiciary system that is more predictable, continuous, uh, and that is really something we lack. And me personally, as GE, Trying to get that information out to the HQ is tough, so hopefully we can get it in a better um, context soon. Mr. Maratav, thank you. I know we work a lot together. Um, processes that you have uh, mentioned is really uh, close to, to me in terms of document authentication process, uh, business license renewals, I, I think as well, some members have said it. So a lot of headaches that we do hope um, will be resolved soon as well uh, as the new uh, implementation comes here. Uh, and then, uh, Dr. Thomas Gunn, thank you so much for being our bridge uh, of the business community and the government. I think uh, you, you put it right, you, you are our facilitator. Um, and uh, as you said, we're eager to see the implementation sooner than later, so uh, we'll be excited to see the next step. And then, of course, our dear president, uh, Mr. Imias, thank you so much for moderating this. Um, and then, of course, dear guests, uh, AMSHAM members, thank you so much for being here, for your active participation. Um, and then, of course, this is one of many more to come. So thank you very much for being with us today. <laughs>